ladies and gents, welcome today. We're here to talk about the funny side of narcissistic abuse. I mean, if there's anything funnier than having your desire to continue existence challenged, I don't know what it is, you know? It's totes illa. Narcissistic abuse is not funny, unfortunately. It's extremely painful for the uh, victim. It makes them uh, typically lose their grip on reality, or at least question their grip on reality itself. Um, it's often said that you know that you're in some derivation on the spectrum of a narcissistically abusive relationship if you've been turned into a detective who constantly looking for clues, trying to fight for reality inside of the illusion of the matrix that the person has plunged you into. One of the problems, of course, with lying a lot and continuously is that it makes the person you're lying to question everything that you ever say or do. If they stay with you, if after you've lied to a person continuously and they stay with you, and they choose not to believe the evidence that they've consumed, but your lying mouth noises, you plunge them into a very stressful state called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a term that's gained popularity in, um, online, in the online psychology spaces, but there seems to be some confusion about what cognitive dissonance is. Cognitive dissonance is actually largely a somatic in the body experience of stress when there are two conflicting beliefs operating at the same time, what Slavoj Žižek refers to as the fetishist split, which he took from the Freudian notion of the split. In Slavoj Žižek's derivation of the Freudian split, you know very well that what the other person is saying is not true. You know very well that it is not necessary that you behave this way, and yet you comply anyway. And this creates tremendous stress. So one of the other things that we know that indicates that somebody's in a narcissistic abusive relationship is they're very, very stressed out and very, very exhausted. And particularly communication and contact with that narcissistic person makes them more stressed out and more exhausted over time until they start to unravel. And as I said, there's no greater source of comedy than having your sanity slowly unravel in front of you. Now, then, there upon, bear with me a moment. There are five things that I'd like you to remember when it's time to leave a narcissist. Let's deal with number one. The first thing is that they are one person and they are not two or three people. They are not sad baby. They are not vulnerable puppy, and yet also persecutory demon or uh, cheating uh, Jezebel, Salome, you know, harpy. They're one person. And them at their worst is the same person. They will fight like hell to convince you that that's not the case. They'll fight like hell to convince you that when they're behaving badly, it's your fault. Uh, you're confused. That's not who they really are. The real person underneath all of these PTSD-induced um, defense mechanisms is kind and loving and good. Um, but this is simply not true. When a person shows you who they are, believe them the first time. That is a quote from someone. I don't know who. Was it Erica Badu? I don't know. Tell me in the comments. It wasn't Erica Badu. It's sometimes attributed to her, but I don't think it is her. Maybe it is her. Let's hope it is her. Was it Nina Simone? Maybe it was her. When a person shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Don't stick around to be told again and again and again. And try, ladies and gents, for the love of all that is holy and decent in this world, to catch it early on. Take it from me. The earlier you catch this and the earlier you spot somebody behaving this way and the earlier you pick up your things, you pick up your toys and go home and go and find somebody else to play with, the easier your life will be. The longer you let this go on for, 
the deeper their tentacles will get inside of you and deeper the hooks will get inside of you and the more painful, more confusing and more crazy making the process of extracting yourself from that relationship will become. One of the things that I teach in the Break the Trauma Bond course, which is a good course, is it's not the person. Your brain, your body will say, they have the power, they're doing this to me. And of course, morally and legally, that is true. But in terms of psychology, and especially in terms of trauma psychology and trauma bonding, you want to remember that actually what is causing this is a relationship that is ongoing. And it's kind of a, um, a perpetually shifting phenomena rather than a static incident with one person. And we also are feeding into it. This is not victim blaming. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not saying it's my fault. Absolutely, you've been deceived. Absolutely, you've been lied to. Absolutely, you've had your love, your kindness, your morality used against you. But we still have to keep putting our hand back in the trap in order for the, ha the trap to function and in order for it to snap shut and cause more pain. So when leaving the narcissist, remember, they are one person, the person who accused you of the most terrible things, the person who lied to you over and over and over again and convinced you or tried to convince you when you caught them in a lie that you were crazy, that you're, there's something wrong with you, that uh, you're paranoid. That's, that's who this person really is. They're one person. They want to convince you that they're multiple people. They'll relate to you as multiple people, which is another part of the Break the Trauma Bond course that we deal with because you can't heal if you relate to them in the way that they've traumatized you to relate to them, which is to several people at the same time, usually typically broadly good and kind and loving. And this is the, the fawn response. And this is the idealization phase and the very romantic and the good sex. If, you, if you're lucky enough to get that, not everybody is, um, that's them. And then the other person is the bully and the, the persecutor who's nasty and who's the fight response in the CPTSD spectrum. The fawn is the nice person, the angelic person that you're dealing with that makes you feel good. And then there's the bully, there's the demon that's gonna persecute you, that's gonna bully you, that's gonna extort you. And basically is saying some variation of do as I say, or else they are that person. The nasty one is them. Remember that when you are doing your best to leave. Go away. Okay. All, all and any contact is an opportunity to lay venomous spider eggs inside of your brain. Not figuratively, um, literally, 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 like literally, literally. No, not literally. I'm joking. If you speak to them, there isn't really a safe way to do it. I've been doing this for years um, and even I have to learn this lesson again and again and again. If you get cocky, if you think that you're above it, if you think that you can't get slimed or that you can't get drawn in, then you're probably going to get humbled if you try to engage in contact for any reason. And it doesn't matter what the context is. It doesn't matter how benign it is. It doesn't matter if you're calling them as I may have done recently, if completely benignly saying, hey, there's an opportunity for you here. It's got nothing to do with me, but it could benefit you. This is something you said you wanted. Do you want this? That inside of five minutes, you will want to throw your phone across a large field in frustration with the utter bollocks that's coming out of their mouths. Any and all opportunity, any and all contact is an opportunity to lay venomous spider eggs inside of your brain. Those spider eggs lay dormant and then they hatch and then they start eating your brain. Figuratively, no, literally this happens. It's uh, just read the published research. Narcissists say words and the words fly through the air with spiders eggs in them, go in your ears, crawl up your ear canal and go into your brain, literally. And then after a few days they hatch. And then you have to deal with what it is that they've said. So you'll find yourself replaying what the narcissist has said to you in the last communication over and over and over again. And they're clever. They're good at what they do. They leave these little surprises, these little eggs in there so that you're left 
having to like analyze every bit of breadcrumbing of a clue to that that could indicate what it is about some important issue i don't know um a, a custody of your children or the division of money of a house ownership or whether they did or didn't cheat on you and exp the specifics of how they didn't didn't cheat on you what they were actually doing when they lied to you and said that they were doing something else so on and so forth they'll never just come out and tell you they'll never just come out and give you the whole truth because to give you the whole truth and, and in all due humility go this is what i did this is the whole thing and i am very sorry that i hurt you this is all the information you need they get confused like it, they want to tell you, but they can't quite remember. So even their confessions, even the confessions and the admissions of guilt are still an opportunity to exploit and abuse and to lay poisonous spiders eggs inside of your brain. Let me check in the comments. You can still hear me. Yes, it looks like it. Number three. The third thing that you must remember, this is painful, but um, it's good to remember. You don't exist. You don't exist to them, to them. They don't see you. They never did see you. I'm sorry if they made you feel seen. I'm sorry if the thing that drew you in was they made you feel heard or they made you feel understood. They're perfectly capable of making you feel seen and heard and understood. My God, they're very good at that. They'll tune in to you to manipulate you into giving them what they want, which will be um, access, uh, status, um, sexual opportunity, money, um, fancy lifestyle, opportunities in the entertainment industry, anything that is like a limited resource that they don't automatically have access to, that they think they can get through you in order to unlock access to those limited resources, sex, money, opportunities, luxury lifestyle, whatever it is, they will decode what it, what your fantasies are. They will do in not just sexual, but in terms of love, romance, or even a job, or um, even inside of a family unit, whatever the ambitions are inside of a family unit. And they will use all of that information against you. And you might say, but if they're doing that and they're analyzing you to such a degree, then you must exist to them. No, no, you don't. We don't exist. We don't exist to them. So you said, but what you just said, they coded you. You are a thing that exists in their reality. So you don't exist outside of their reality. We talk narcissism, but if we were good philosophers and less psychologists, we would talk solipsism. Narcissists are the ultimate solipsists. They have an entirely self-referential ideological worldview in which they are the center of everything. They are prime cause. They are the beginning, the end, alpha and omega. They are all that is. So of course you don't exist as a person. You don't exist as a separate human being. You exist as a, an internal thing that if I, like an app on a phone, like if I can decode this phone, it's gonna give me what I want. If I can decode this app, it'll give me what I want. And if it's annoying me and it's frustrating, it doesn't give me what I want, I'll discard it and I'll go and find something else. Think about it. Think about how you have been treated. Think about how roughly you've been treated. How I described it recently, um, when I was doing my emotional literacy, I was like, well, how do I feel? I was like, I feel bruised. I feel bruised. I feel as though I've been picked up in the, the huge claws, huge steel claws of a greedy, um, a, a psychopathic machine monster that wanted to get something from me, but couldn't wait, was impatient with me. I feel bruised, I feel manhandled emotionally. I feel absolutely um, used up. And, and, and other words besides that I won't mention here, but let me just say, it certainly feels like I wasn't given the opportunity con to consent. And it certainly didn't feel like oppor the opportunity to consent was a priority for them. So I am a thing. You are a thing. We don't exist to them as separate entities. You must remember that when you're leaving, because if you will, we'll cover this in the, in, the, in the other points. But if you look for closure or you look for sanity, You'd be like, I am a person. They are a person. We are both adults. We kind of talk like two adults. No, you can't. 
You're not a person. You're not a person. You're a thing. And that's why you are so roughly handled. And that's why you're so roughly treated. And that's why you feel so bruised after all contact with them. And after a narcissistic abusive relationship, you walk around for six to 12 months feeling totally bruised and very sensitive and very fragile to everything emotionally as you would be physically if your body was bruised. Oh, this is a kicker. The fourth thing that you should remember is that in their world and in the shared fantasy space that you have with a narcissist that you must break, they are not obliged to behave morally at all. So within, so they, 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 they may be in legal circles if, if, they're a, if they're court and they have to go to a courtroom, absolutely. But inside of their reality, and the reality that you two have created, they are not obliged to behave morally at all. You are, you are, you're the moral core of the relationship. You will be held to the highest moral standards at all times. They, not one bit, not one bit, not now, not ever. You will be expected to have an impeccable moral uh, outlook and an impeccable moral behavior, hyper conscientious, always doing the right thing, always telling the truth. They are simply not held to any moral standards whatsoever. You should do, you would do well to remember that leaving a narcissist because you'll drive yourself crazy if you go back to them, trying to communicate with them, trying to get that closure and being like, dude, or do that. Don't you see what you have done here is wrong. You're wasting your breath. They don't see it as wrong. Nothing they do is wrong. They are perfect. They are at the center of their own worlds. They are the prince or princess of solipsism and their own little planet. And no, they haven't done any wrong. And you really are wasting your time. You're doing more than wasting your time. You're annoying them. And if you keep going, bringing up all the things they've done wrong, you're just going to inflict narcissistic injury, then you'll inflict narcissist, uh, then you'll induce narcissistic rage, and then they will persecute you. They will find ways to punish you that really, really hurt. I've had a recent experience, and I only in the last couple of days have woken up to exactly what this person was doing. And I was like, hang on a second. Don't they know that that one thing is the one thing that really hurts me? And then my brain, which is a smart ass, comes back with, yes, yes, they do. They do. I was there when you told them in the beginning of the relationship, oh, oh, so wisely, that that's the one thing that would hurt you the most. And I'm sat there going, hmm, I'm so glad I'm an expert. And above all of this now. They're not obliged to behave morally at all within the shared fantasy space. The shared fantasy space is something we have to expand the concept of. I've been saying that it is um, like the matrix. So I have a course on this called uh, Unplugged from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse. And it's about breaking the shared fantasy space. It's not just that they put you into a virtual reality. It's that you share their worldview, even uh, becoming um, infected with their emotional dysregulation and their issues, including their attachment issues. So if you're if you're normally quite emotionally regulated, not particularly sentimental about relationships, fairly practical, fairly grounded, not very clingy with people, haven't got like a weird attachment style or anything, and you're with them or interacting with them, and suddenly you find yourself hyper emotional, hyper sentimental really weird on the attachment front, suddenly having tremendous abandonment anxiety, which you have barely experienced before in your whole life, that's actually due to the shared fantasy. You're picking up their stuff because in this intimate space, there's a kind of a unification. It's not just that you're getting in a pod, you're getting into a matrix pod. It's more like you're getting into their pod with them and then sharing their mad space which includes mental illness and i want to talk about that in this this uh pointer number five let's have a little chat about mental illness the fifth thing i want you to remember 
when you are leaving a narcissist is you will be tempted at times to plead, to plead the case. You'll walk away from a, from a conversation or an argument and wounds will be open and have been left ripped open and things that will have been said that are just so wildly unfair that you'll think, hang on a minute, he or she couldn't have meant to leave it like this. Just, just let me go back and try and reason with them. Just let me go back and try and reason with them. And you're, you're, you're pleading with the devil. In a way, you're begging for mercy. You're begging for sanity. You're begging for truth or you're pleading for closure. Don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. That isn't another adult human being that you can reason with. You must abandon any and all attempt at sincere communication when communicating with the terminally insincere. It will do nothing. It will only hurt you. Any and all contact is an opportunity to lay venomous spider eggs inside of your brain. Don't beg for mercy, sanity, truth or closure. Expect lunacy. And I, I, I do mean lunacy. I do mean lunacy. People say in the comments, that's not very politically correct. You're using shaming language. You're demonizing people. I'm not demonizing people. And there's no such thing as shaming language in this context. This is criminal behavior. It's criminal behavior. Just because you have a mental health issue does not absolve you legally, except in very rare cases, nor does it absolve you morally, in my view. It is not a merit badge to have a personality disorder, nor is it an astrological sign, nor is it a preferred sexual picadillo, nor is it something that you can just write for fun on your effing Instagram bio. Having a personality disorder, by definition, is maladaptive. That means not well adapted to the environment for you or for the people around you. It includes the social environment. It means you suffer and the people around you suffer. If it is a cluster B personality disorder, it is particularly egregious and particularly taxing to the social environment. Meaning lovers, husbands, wives, family members, friends and co-workers. It is not a merit badge. It is not an astrology sign. It is a bad thing, a very bad thing. It is a mental illness. And that's not me shaming it. That is what it is. It's defined by a criminal lack of morality. It is defined by the knowing will to cause harm. We're starting to develop this thing now where anything that's a mental illness is just, oh, that person can't do anything about it. The courts don't agree with you, nor do the philosophers, nor do the psychologists, and nor do I. This is made up. It's pish. It's pish absolute pish stop it expect lunacy expect lunacy you will not be disappointed expect a dirty carpet now here it is you sit there in your nice living room and everything is clean and pleasant and nice and you invite a lunatic into your living room a screaming howling lunatic howl at the moon Luna, Luna, lunatic. And they make a terrible mess all over the carpet and on your curtains. And the next day you wake up with your lunatic that you decided to install in the living room. And you say to me, Richard, Richard, I am not as calm today as I was yesterday. And I stand there and I stroke my chin and I go, good heavens, if only I knew why. You put a lunatic in the living room. That's not where lunatics go. And if a lunatic is in your living room, you can expect pain and you can expect dirt and you can expect noise and you can expect chaos and you can expect to feel dirty and hurt for as long as they're in there. And once you've got the strength to get them out for some time after. So get them out as quickly as you can. This is the only way. I will now take your questions. Om Ganapataya, Om Ganapataya.
Algorithm says the stench lingers for sure. It certainly does. And leave us feeling very slimed indeed. Which is it possible to cut these sort of people out of your life without legal involvement when there are no assists involved? Um, yes, it's possible to cut these people out of your life, of course. Any advice on parents? Everything that I've said would apply to parents in exactly the same way, no difference. Rich, can a psychopath have empathy? Empathy is defined etymologically only as the ability to create an accurate simulation of what the other person is thinking or feeling internally. It's um, effective intersubjective simu simulations, basically. I'm, I'm guessing very well what it is that you're thinking and feeling through observing you. So psychopaths do have empathy. Um, the split is in the language. So now we use empathy, but what we kind of mean is what we would used to call compassion. So empathy is, is cold. Compassion is warm. Uh, can a psychopath have empathy? By definition, if they're an effective psychopath, they certainly have empathy. Um, are they kind? No. Are they compassionate? My God, no. Um, do they have effective empathy? Affective empathy? A, no, they don't. They wouldn't be a psychopath if they had effect effective empathy. They would be depending on who you ask and what the um, definitions would be, they could be a factor two psychopath or, or what people used to call a sociopath if they had, uh, if they were uh, criminally behaving but still showed signs of affective empathy. Uh, I'm sorry, I've lost, the, I've lost a few questions there because it scrolled up really, really fast. Any advice on family that they've used to play their games for them? Um, oh, you mean they turn the family, they instrumentalize the family and turn them into flying monkeys? Um, I don't really have advice. You must uh, keep living your life and keep being you to the best of your ability and um, hope that people uh, come to their own realizations. Uh, perhaps you could try to intervene and say, hey, did you realize you were being instrumentalized and being used with uh, select family members? You could try. Can they energetically pick up your feelings from a distance? Are they that switched on? Not energetically. They can do it by looking at you and using their brains. It's actually quite easy to pick up what people are feeling from a distance. It's just that you as a normal sane person, not a robber, not a con artist, not a a seducer would, would typically do that. But if you go to a public space and you look at people and try run the experiment, just look at five different people and try and figure out what it is that they're feeling, that part of your brain will kick in and you'll be like, oh yeah, I think I have a rough idea of what it is that they probably are feeling. Now you did that five times and you would have had some degree of accuracy because you're a human and they're humans. Um, if you'd done that your whole life, you would get very, very good at it. Would you speak on dementia and NPD? I know nothing about dementia. It should be spoken about uh, by like a, a doctor or a, a neurobiologist, somebody who understands dementia. How can I break free of the trauma bond? I have a course called Break the Trauma Bond. It'll be available again soon. On It might even be available now on richardgranon.com. Alternatively, the new version of the Break the Trauma Bond course is inside of the Unplug from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse course, which is also on richardgranon.com. Uh, Iman Hadji, uh, do you think a narcissist can be remorseful? I don't think you watched this video, you must have joined late. Uh, no. Um, and take accountability for their actions? No. Um, and wanting to change? No. Nope. Or is that someone scoring high on narcissism without being one? Um, well, I don't know, but I can tell you that isn't narcissistic personality disorder. And somebody who, ha who scores highly for narcissistic traits, even though they both have the term narcissism in the title. So you go, here's one person, here's Bill. He scores highly for narcissistic traits. 
and here's Bob. Well, he's full blown MPD, but they're based. This one's a nine out of ten, and this one's a ten out of ten. Right? Wrong. There's a, there's a binary state. If you have NPD, in my opinion, you're not reachable. You're not reachable. There's pure solipsism. There's no accountability. There's no remorse because there's no outside world. If you're high in narcissistic traits, you're still you still have a core. You still have a moral core. You uh, still are reachable. Um, but the other guy is just, just not reachable. So don't fool yourselves into thinking, oh, like I keep hearing people say, it's a spectrum. The narcissistic traits are on a spectrum, but NPD is, is binary. It is, it's a one or a zero. It either is there or it isn't. And if it is there, you ain't breaking it. You ain't breaking it. No, nobody's shown me anything that looks like uh, conclusive evidence that there has ever been an effective therapy for narcissistic personality disorder. And it includes, that includes the use of, uh, of psychedelics. It's very resistant, very, very resistant. Is it normal to feel blocked in doing anything? I just feel so tired. Uh, even after six months ending, if you have physical problems, you should see a doctor. Um, you should see if you've developed an allergy for something, maybe try a dietitian or a nutritionist, and maybe try going to a gym and uh, clearing up your diet maybe try excluding certain foods and certain additives from your diet and seeing if that helps it not everything is psychology not everything is like oh it's trauma it's inside my head some of these things are actually physical um and or hormonal uh how to get your self-respect back to build up the courage to finally get them out of your house once and for all um i don't know i don't know i've never lived that experience um oh no hang on i did live that experience oh shit that's not true how did i do it jesus i wrote about this in my book uh, a cult of one i did throw one out of the house and that did take some balls and spine and brain and other bits of awful i <laughs> yeah she made a mistake <laughs> She sent me to therapy. She was like, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I was like, yes, dear, I am. Oh, God, it's all my fault. And uh, so I went to therapy. And the therapist, who was a nice chap in uh, Dublin, in Malahide, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, uh, he said, uh, I, think, I think you'll find that um, your ex-girlfriend, uh, sorry, your, your girlfriend is, is very, very sick. And uh, we had a conversation about narcissistic personality disorder. And I said, ha ha, I do seminars on narcissistic personality disorder. And he said, ha ha, I know that. I have Google in my office. So um, yeah, I did therapy. I did therapy that she sent me to. She sent me to therapy for, uh, I don't know, like sex addiction and um, some other thing, which he also laughed at. He was like, well, this is nonsense. Uh, and then the final, final thing, because I was getting better, she got angrier and angrier and angrier. And it was getting really, really bad. And she said, right, we're going to a relationship therapist. And I was sat there going, I don't know what you don't get about me going to therapists and you losing control, but okay, I'll drive. <laughs> so I drove us. Again, in Dublin, to a, a quite well-known uh, South African uh, relationship therapist. And inside of two sessions, uh, I started working with him and, con and being in communication with him directly once. And uh, he, he just, he just, he never said she has an narcissistic personality disorder. My counsellor did. The relationship therapist just said, you know, you know what you need to do. And I went, oh, fuck. And he said, go home. Get yourself ready. And when she comes home, you face the dragon. You only have to do this once. And uh, that's what I did. So I was sort of coming back through the therapeutic process. <laughs> but, but I'm still such a codependent. So I paid for this house that, that was what's Malahide's expensive. Like the, all of Dublin's super expensive for rent. And uh, she had a dog, which made it really difficult. And she wanted a sea view and this and that and the other thing. So I'd spent all this money getting this like beautiful penthouse apartment. And at first I was like, 
I think I've moved out. I was like, okay, I'm split up with you. So what's fair is you keep the apartment and I'll go stay in a hotel. And I think I did four hours in a hotel and I called her up and I was like, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. That's my apartment. You have to move out. And uh, I think I, I think I said to her, stay in the spare room. I'm staying in the master bedroom. I've paid for everything. Um, and you move out. You move out. You're an adult. This is your choice. This is what you've done. This is what you wanted. And uh, that was it. So therapy. So in my case, it was therapy. And then just bit by bit, finding the the courage to just say no. And that was one of the things that I worked on with, with my counsellor was uh, not the relationship therapist, the counsellor. And this was, it took place, I've just condensed the short story. It took place over like uh, two months to slowly, slowly start saying no more and more. So when she would say to me, you're being off with me, I would say, no, no, I'm not. And calmly, not like, no, I'm not. Or no, I'm not. Stop persecuting me. Not angry, not self pitying me. Just, just no, no. I, I, I'm really not. I think you're. Uh, I think you're mistaken. No, I know. I know you are. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not being off with you. So learning to say no was was huge, and it really, really helped. But it takes time. Uh, it takes time. It takes time. I wish you well. Let me uh, answer two more questions, and then I will go away. But I will always be here. Do not be afraid. Don't go into abandonment anxiety. I'm always around. I'm always around, but I have stuff to do. Uh, okay, I don't see any more questions. Grey rock technique. Yes, it's uh, very good. Any more questions? How do you feel about the body keeps the score? Uh, I've never read it. But by Peter Levine, but the quotes I read look cool. He seems like a really cool guy who really understands trauma. And the focus on importance of releasing trauma trapped in the body, if, if you can, like, I don't know if it works, but like if you can work your body and your mind and there are techniques for releasing trauma that's locked in. I don't know where trauma would go, like in the armpit, in the nipple, in the elbow crease. I don't know where, like, but, and if you can release it, great. And it makes you feel better, awesome. Don't ignore the body. 100%. One more. My Juma. My Juma, my Juma, my Juma, my Juma. Never give up hope ever, says Rhonda. Is this live? Yes. Is there a correlation between high count, body count, and BPD in females? Are you trying to start a war? In my comment section, man. Uh, uh, I, I, the only thing I know about high body counts and um, and BPD is for is for men and women. And yes, there are studies that indicate that. Let me see if I can remember. So they defined in this particular piece of research sexual promiscuity but also emotional promiscuity and they did cross correlate between men and women but i can't remember the details but but for sure across both genders if you are the more emotionally promiscuous and the more physically promiscuous you are there is a correlation with in, uh, it, it, more intense forms of emotional dysregulation which then of course eventually uh, correlates all across the uh, the spectrum through to somebody showing up with what would tick the boxes for borderline personality disorder, whatever that may or may not be, which is not an argument we're going to get into today. It might just be CPTSD and fragile narcissism. But who said who said that? Who said that? Why would you? We're wrapping up. Let's not create drama. Listen, I'm not here to upset people. Wait, what's emotional promiscuity? Y'all, y'all's is gonna have to go look it up. Emotional prom promiscuity, forming emotional bonds with lots of people, is is emotional uh, promiscuity. But it's better defined in the research. Listen, there's something called Google Scholar. You go to googlescholar.com and you put your favorite search terms in, 
and research comes up based on those search terms, you don't have to read the whole paper. You don't have to give yourself a headache. You can just do, if you want a really simple way to absorb a research paper, read the abstract and then scroll down to the bottom and read the conclusion and then leave before that headache starts. It has to be written in language that is understandable uh, and that people can grasp. It just it, that's that's just the way published research works. Uh, Okie dokie. Well, I probably have done enough. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Shiken harumitsu dai komyo. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers.